thank you thank you very much and welcome everybody to our last uh, um, let's say webinar of this uh, amazing series about the expressive body I still just two minutes to thank all the guests and speakers who took part in this second edition of the series. And uh, it has been a very, very rich edition, international edition, which has uh, seen dialogues between neuroscientists, uh, actresses, uh, actors, uh, and dancers uh, around uh, a theme that is uh, particularly dear to us, uh, so that of the, the body, uh, as an expressive and cognitive uh, and cognitive medium and, and um, a lot of uh, points of, of, of reflection emerged and I believe that this is a, a, um, a richness for us, for all the people working around uh, the body, thinking about the body and using their body in um, as a profession. And uh, I also thank uh, who made it uh, possible the, to realize this uh, series, starting from the head of the Neuroscience and Humanities Lab, Vittorio Gallese, and the colleagues from the DUSIC department, uh, and uh, for technical support, uh, Raffaella Carluccio and uh, Nunzio Langiulli. So I'm now very happy and honored to uh, present uh, Vittorio Gallese and Anna Wojciechowski, our speakers, today's speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. It's uh, a privilege, an honor and a great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, to you uh, Professor Anna Wojciechowski. Uh, is an early modernist and literary theorist specialized in the history of subjectivity. She earned her PhD at Yale University in the Interdisciplinary uh, Renaissance Studies Program. And she's currently the Arthur Tamam and Wilhelmina Dore Tamam Professor of English at the University of Texas at Austin and an affiliate of the program in Comparative Literature and of the South Asia Institute. She recently edited Shakespeare Cymbeline for the New Kittredge Shakespeare series. In 2011, she published uh, for Cambridge University Press the book Group Identity in the Renaissance World, where she explored the history of group subjectivity, analyzing the unconscious dynamics of group identity formation in a global context, offering a new paradigm for the study of early modernity. And she has been an international leader uh, since many years in the literature and neuroscience debate for years. She's a very good friend of mine and we have been collaborating uh, since more than 10 years and we, we plan to continue doing so uh, uh, in the present and in the future. So I will now uh, leave the floor to Anna, I will share the screen uh, uh, to present the slide. And uh, Anna, all right, there we go. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and for uh, uh, joining me uh, in this conversation about uh, an incredibly interesting theater project in uh, Montechiello, Italy, uh, near Siena. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Teatro Povero and their theatrical experiment that has been running for about uh, more than half a century. Uh, they perform what are called autodrama or autodrami, self-dramas, and they, this is an outdoor uh, theater festival held each summer uh, in one of their uh, piazzas. So I'm going to connect uh, the, uh, their work to the, the discourse of embodied cognition. And I'll be focusing on an early play that they did called Quel Se Aprile del 44. What's interesting about the play is that it uh, restaged the near destruction of that town and its people 
by German and fascist troops during World War II. Uh, there was a full-length version of the play that actually gave rise to autodrama as a form, which I'll explain. Uh, it was first performed in 69 and then reprised in uh, 75. And a portion of the play was incorporated into a kind of anthology play in 1970 called uh, Noe di Montichiello. So uh, it's also filtered, fil uh, featured in a film called Spettacolo. I don't know if you've seen this, but I totally recommend it. Very watchable. Uh, made by Americans. Uh, it's half in Italian. Uh, some of it is in English. And it's a work of art in its own right. But it's um, a very useful introduction to Quelse Aprile because it incorporates archival footage and interviews with some of the original cast members who uh, were at the time of filming quite old and who have died in the meantime. Um, so uh, let's see, I'm going to base my analysis not only on that film, but on the uh, published play text on Vittorio Galese's interviews with this man, Andrea Cresti, who just died in 2021 at the age of 83, and also on critical analyses of the performance, all their performances. Uh, there's a, a vast archive of materials associated with the Teatro Povero, and so I can only touch on uh, some, of the, some of the history here. So let's go through the chapters. My talk runs about 40 minutes. Uh, I will read much of it, but also talk through parts of it. Um, I'll talk about the origins of the company and the form they call autodrama. Then I'm going to offer uh, uh, um, an approach that I call embodied cognitive microhistory, which is based on uh, the ideas of Carlo Ginsberg, as well as the whole uh, body of discourse on embodied cognition. I'll talk about the play itself and then uh, the play as a site specific performance. Uh, thinking about how the, the fortress itself is a container or the hilltop uh, of Montechiello is a container for the, uh, the people, their emotions and their history. And uh, then a brief conclusion. Thanks for that. First, uh, next slide please. Um, the Origins of Autodrama. In 2017, the film I mentioned, Spettacolo, opens with grainy black and white footage of Montechiello as seen from an approaching vehicle. Slowly climbing the steep road of the town, the vehicle nears, then passes through the, uh, let's back up to that one, Victoria, uh, the gate, um, passes through the single medieval archway leading into the walled enclave. It is winter. Visual clues from within the footage, cars, the clothing of two isolated figures, uh, a sign, as well as the aspect ratio of the images, suggest that we are being introduced to an older incarnation of the town, one that was perhaps filmed several decades ago, uh, yet we're not sure which past we're in. And originally I wanted to show a clip, but that's not possible. So I'll just describe uh, what happens. Uh, over the melancholy strains of a solo clarinet, an unseen man, who turns out to be Andrea Cresti, tells a story. I'll read it in English. I think it was just by chance. There was no plan. Just by chance, we turned our lives into a play. Our piazza became our stage, and everyone in town played a role. At a certain point, we realized that the play wasn't just an annual event. It was more of a lifelong event. And so our life became one long play. As he speaks, we see a rapid montage of scenes from a series of outdoor theatrical performances, which illustrate the voiceover narration. We watch men and women of all ages preparing stage sets and performing in a range of scenes that appear to have been filmed over many years. They pique our curiosity. Who are these people? When did they perform their plays and under what circumstances? The word caso, chance, cues viewers to recognize that something unexpected and unprecedented has happened here that we do not understand as yet, and, ha and that has to do with a unique theatrical experience. The opening lines of the film, recorded in Italian, 
switch freely between present and past tenses. They reveal a fluid temporality notably different from that of its English subtitles, which describes actions and events only in past tense. The deliberate blending and fusion of past and present, reflected in the voiceover of Andrea Cresti, who, uh, as I said, was the longtime director of the Teatro Povero, is a signature feature of the intentional community of Montechielo, a community that has found its purpose in confronting its past and present through a theatrical experiment that has lasted more than half a century. Since I'm not showing the clip, I'll explain that people get together like this in the winter, uh, have a meeting with as many people who want to participate as possible. The town is quite small now, um, barely over 100. Uh, and they think about things they could put in a play, uh, but it's, it's about their lives and it's about their situation and the state of the world. Often they play themselves or each other. They play versions of themselves. I mean, it's, uh, it's very creative. Hence the title, Self-Drama. Um, every winter for half a century, the citizens gather to discuss their problems and conflicts, both collective and personal, out of which they develop a theme for their annual summer festival. After the discussions have concluded, a team of writers, which I believe for a long time was led by Cresty, um, write a script. And we see that process in the movie Spectacular. The script is revised by the full collective, rehearsed, uh, and then performed for an outdoor audience over three weeks each summer. As I said, sometimes people play themselves or fictional versions of themselves, younger versions of themselves, relatives, ancestors, neighbors fictional characters. Autodrama is their approach to coping with the problems of the present and the heavy weight of the past. The term autodrama or self-drama was proposed in 1970 by Giorgio Strehler, renowned director of Milan's Piccolo Teatro. This was his way of naming a new theatrical form as he saw it. So it has affinities with things like community theater, oh, various kinds of political, uh, and ideological critiques, certainly with forms of therapy such as psychodrama, but it's uh, it's distinctive. It's got its own um, dynamic and uh, purpose. Driving that project at first was this man, uh, Mario Guidotti. You've probably heard of him. He was uh, artistic director of the company for the first 12 years. And he wrote a lot of the scripts, including the one that we're talking about today, and uh, helped develop the collaborative form that became autodrama. He suggested the name Teatro Povero, which he borrowed from this man, um, Jerzy Grotowski, uh, who I'm sure many of you uh, know or know of, a Polish director and experimentalist who wrote about poor theater. And interestingly, he was directing a festival at Spoleto starting in 67. So also in that same year, the Montechielesi thought, well, we'll do what other small towns around here do, which is put on a Bruxello, an antique verse form drama presenting historical or legendary stories. And they used, they drew on people from the town who were not trained actors to do so. But after a couple of years, they thought, yeah, we don't want to do that anymore. Uh, so they came up with a new concept and it was this one, it was this play uh, that restaged the near massacre of everybody in the town by Nazis. Definitely an attention grabber. So what grew out of this return and a restaging of the shattering experience that many people in the town were in or had heard about as children or from relatives and friends, uh, became the basis for this genuinely new form of popular theater. There's a critic named uh, Lita Crociani Vinland who says, this play marks the moment when the theater started to develop the formula of dramatizing itself, eroding the distance between action and acting, end quote. And it's at that point that they moved from indoors to outdoors to this piazza that you see, um, uh, which they used for many years. 
uh, they've switched in the meantime, or since then, to a different one. Uh, and they began to draw on their own stories for each uh, season thereafter. From the beginning, autodrama has functioned as a means of holding the community together and strengthening the ties between the people, uh, while simultaneously exploring and embracing the precarity of life in this tiny village uh, for a lot of reasons, including, well, especially depopulation, because the town is really emptying out, uh, like a lot of places in the region and in the United States as well. Uh, the uniqueness of the theatrical form invented by the company, which can be viewed as a technology for maintaining collective attachment to the place, to the place itself, cannot be overemphasized. Next slide, please. Okay, chapter two, embodied cognitive microhistory. Uh, this is building on uh, the works of Carlo Ginsberg. Next, I propose a framework uh, for understanding the tradition of autodrama that I'm calling embodied cognitive microhistory. Uh, it's inspired by someone whose works I'm sure you know well, Carlo Ginsberg, who developed the concept of microstoria or microhistory that's informing my talk. Uh, he and other microhistorians have focused their attention on individuals or small groups rather than impersonal macro processes of social history. Uh, another historian, David Bell, describes microhistory this way as explicitly as a form that explicitly rejected large scale social scientific models so as to focus in minute detail on particular individuals, dense tissues of interpersonal relationships and the operation of human free will. Uh, uh, building their narratives uh, out of rich and unfamiliar archival materials and writing with almost cinematic elan, microhistorians recount histories of common people who are often in conflict with elites. Ginsburg, in, in a very interesting essay, wants to figure out their the origin of that term, microhistory. And it turns out that possibly the first person to use it was Primo Levi in the periodic table in that last story called Carbon. Uh, I'm not going to quote it, this is a long passage, but um, Ginsburg, sorry, yeah, Ginsburg is thinking about Levy. Um, and in response to, uh, to that uh, book, says that the reduction of scale suggested by the word microhistory fits in with the acknowledgement of the limits of existence with the sense of one's own capacities. So it's, it's incredible for a lot of reasons, I think, that, uh, that World War II is behind this, this concept as well. Um, there's a kind of interesting convergence of feelings and ideas, I'd say. So I'd like to build on Ginsburg this um, uh, kind of expanded version that I'm calling embodied cognitive microhistory. History as lived experience, recorded and remembered in the living bodies of individuals and groups over time. So that's history understood not as the single event or the inciting event or events, but something else, a process, recursive, combinatory, ongoing, uh, a process of meaning making at the center of human cultural production. Next slide, please. Um, embodied cognitive microhistory investigates cultural history by drawing on recent discoveries of subpersonal cognitive processes in order to shed light on events that are normally described at the personal, interpersonal, or institutional levels. And it moves back and forth between levels of description. So Vittorio has written about this a lot, and he might want to talk about that. How you can combine subpersonal accounts of how the brain works with what's happening uh, in a community, for example. Theories of embodied cognition, although not constituting a unitary research program, all rest on the idea that the body plays a major role in cognition. These theories propose that cognitive processes like language and narrative, reading, reasoning, and mind reading are rooted in our sensory motor systems. And again, Vittorio has done 
pathbreaking work, uh, as have many of you in, uh, in this field. Let's see, so uh, there were six features. Victoria, could we please go back to those real quick? Just the six features. Um, embodied, recursive, distributed, transmissible, proliferative, and generative. Okay, thank you. So now I'll explain each one. Um, if it's embodied, you know, right? I mean, this is bringing in embodied cognition and micro moves from being about, you know, individuals to even to including also some personal accounts of phenomena <laughs> such as human memory, mirroring, sensory perception, and so on. Anything you want. Uh, it's recursive. What does that mean? Well, when I was writing this talk, I googled this and I found that two weeks ago there was uh, a set of memorial events for the Battle of Montechiello. Uh, per non dimenticare. So there's a kind of recursion uh, in this type of history or this approach where we study the ways that individuals and collectives circle back uh, to a set of events and uh, repeat it. Not always the same way, but they, they come back to it. Uh, that's associated uh, with, with trauma, but I wouldn't uh, leave out positive experiences as well. Uh, it's distributed. So I'm sure a lot of you know about distributed cognition. Uh, I'm thinking here about the ways that the story and memories are carried by members in the group, are built out by members in the group, are performed by members in the group. So it is a, a process of collective memory here. And they're also pushed out, as I say on the slide, into an audience of thousands each summer who also do some of the work of thinking this through. Next slide, please. It's transmissible. Well, that goes with distributed, I think. Take a look at the slide. This is an early performance. I can't tell you which point in the play it is, but what I want you to look at is the body language. And I went down a rabbit hole with this slide, just studying each person. Because what we have here is a record of an embodied reception of the play. And I want you to notice how many people have their arms tightly folded across their gut, you know. Um, but there are other postures as well that are interesting. Um, we can come back to that if you want. But imagine it being transmitted, the story. Next slide, please. Proliferative. Uh, it proliferates. It's not just a play that gets performed. It's uh, the original events inciting processes of replication and mimesis. Performances take on a life of their own that recreate and may upstage the inciting events. In other words, the play may become more important than what happened in the first place, in a certain sense. Commemorations and monuments, I just talked about one. Photographs, plays, films, interviews, websites, artworks, histories, critical analyses, dissertations, discussions, paratexts of many kinds. So think of uh, the way that history can uh, proliferate in all these forms. Lastly, it's generative, meaning it is productive, it is the productive afterlife of trauma become drama. It is a process of meaning making that uh, is incredibly valuable. All right, let's talk about the play. As I said, it's bound up with a collective trauma. The near annihilation of the town of Montechiello during World War II. Uh, and it's a story of individual heroism and group heroism. On the 6th of April, 1944, a group of 70 partisans encamped in the woods around Montechiello. They waged a pitched battle there against several hundred, some say 400 members of the newly, fa newly commissioned Fascist Republican Guard. Uh, those people had been dispatched by the prefect of Siena 
named Giorgio Alberto Chiurico, Chiurco to kill the partisans. Uh, you just saw a talk on Henry V. Think about five to one odds that are remembered in that play, Henry V by Shakespeare. Uh, this is also roughly five to one odds. Uh, there was a protract protracted uh, rifle and machine gun battle or exchanges, and uh, the fascists were routed by this much smaller uh, group of partisans. But there was a reprisal. And the following day, German SS troops who had tanks and cannons uh, stormed Montechielo. Soldiers dragged the townspeople from their beds and lined them up against the walls of the city. They marched them out the gate and they said, we're going to shoot you. Um, so they kind of stood there for a long time, maybe an hour, as they were waiting for the command to kill everybody. Uh, and that would have been as a punishment for helping partisans, which in fact they had. Um, and there were, in fact, partisans lined up against the walls. But there was someone who intervened. Her name was uh, Irma Angeben. And she came forward to plead for the lives of the people. She was German herself, which was really, really lucky for everybody there. Um, with the help of the parish priest, whose name was Don Marino Toriti, uh, Angeben pleaded with the commander for an hour ultimately convincing him of the innocence of the Montechielesi and persuading him not to execute the village. So this looks kind of like the real thing, but it's not, it's the play. And that woman is uh, Irma Manjavakia, Manjavaki playing on Gaben. Uh, after standing against the wall for an hour with their hands in the air, the citizens finally heard the command house and they fled to safety. Again, this is not the real thing. This is one of the a scene from one of the plays, the performances. More than two decades later, more than two decades passed after this uh, narrow escape from death uh, that they decided to put on the play. And it had a lot of significance in the region because 15,000, up, upwards of 15,000 people were killed. I'm talking about civilians uh, during regional massacres. So it was a, a miracle really that they did not die that day. Um, there's a, a theater historian named Richard Andrews who's done more to document the works of the Teatro Povero than anybody, well, in English anyway. Uh, he wrote of Quel Aprile, Quel Se Aprile, quote, the Montechialesi were transforming into a theatrical spectacle for their own contemplation as well as that of the outside world, selected aspects of their present reality. They would find very soon that they could not do so without also coming to terms on stage and off with the past, which had created their present, unquote. When asked if the cast had a sense at the time that they were enacting traumatic events, uh, Andrea Cresti, the director, the later director, he, he was in this play, but wasn't directing it. He said, yes, of course. And in my view, staging those events was foundational for our theater company. If we had not done so, we would have made a grave mistake. By the way, that was Vittorio's interview with Cresti very shortly before he died. Uh, I wanted to show you a clip, but I can't. So instead, I'll, I'll take stills from the movie, which are from the archives of the play. Also, um, uh, th the Teatro Povero website has all kinds of pictures. If you're interested, you might want to look through. A traumatic near-death experience, such as that endured by the citizens of Montechielo, can be extraordinarily difficult to process. It can haunt an individual for a lifetime. Did I skip something? Maybe. Um, and people can experience, experience moments of crippling sadness. Research on the impact of PTSD, on what and how individuals remember of the traumatic events has recently corroborated a new conception of long-term memory according to which long-lasting perceptual representations may be automatically encoded and be functionally distinct 
from verbal representations. So I believe Victoria is going to talk about that. Uh, let's stop on this one. What we have here is a moment after uh, a performance, the, the 75 performance, and there were actual partisans there who joined the actors who played the partisans. Um, you see Elda Panjavaki there on the right playing uh, Senora Angeben and many of the townspeople. And they were clearly overjoyed uh, by what the play accomplished. Um, so let's see, let's turn to our next chapter. Where are we, Victoria? Oh yeah, here we are. Beautiful picture of Elda. And this is the, um, this is one of the people in the film, Spetacolo, who was there at the, at the battle. He talks about it briefly, very old now, saying, when he, he tears up and he says, it's better not to think about it. He's still really, really upset. So uh, I would like to have shown you the clip just to demonstrate the persistence of trauma in memory and the way that one can cycle back to it at unexpected moments. So uh, chapter four is on site-specific performance. Uh, the Hilltop Fortress as Container. As the Teatro Povero, ex Povero exemplifies, memories of past traumatic experiences um, can serve as a powerful stimulus to live the remainder of one's life more fully and intentionally, more generatively. When a group of individuals experience such a trauma, the processing and recovery may require collective effort and become an ongoing communal endeavor. Over many decades, the citizens of Monte Chielo developed their own unique approach to reckoning with the near destruction of their commune on that day uh, and memorializing, memorializing it through dramatic narrative. Central to Quel Se Aprile, the inaugural autodrama of this group, was the restaging of a group level trauma. As, as earlier noted, many individuals were dragged from their beds that April morning by Nazis who wanted to exact vengeance um, on the group. And many of those people were still alive for the 69 and 75 performance and well beyond. Many of them participated in the play. Richard Andrews, the critic I mentioned a moment ago, says, I quote, the therapeutic value of such an exercise is so obvious that it hardly needs elaborating. In retrospect, though, it now seems as if the villagers simply needed to get that particular experience out of their system before moving on to dramatize something else. So Andrews thinks that they got over it. Uh, I, I'm not sure that they got over it that quickly. Uh, I think partly, uh, but remember they performed it in 1969. They performed a piece of it again in 70, and then they remounted the whole thing in 75. As I talked about earlier, they're still commemorating the Battle of Montechiela, what happened there uh, two weeks ago. So I'm not sure it's over. And there's a desire to remember because, because that memory becomes foundational to the maintenance and the, the functioning of a group identity that is needed to keep, to keep the town going. It's not just about the theater company, it's about how people live their lives in that space. Um, Montechielo's first autodrama was not only a restaging of a traumatic event, the externalization of which helped to cement the identity of the community, but it was also an attempt to reclaim a violated space. So that's where I'm going with this particular section of the talk. So by using the town as its performance space for the autodrama of the near massacre and for every single play thereafter, Montechielo's Teatro Povero resecured the violated space. 
against the terrifying recollections of its citizens and allowing people there to maintain their attachment to the village, the land around it, and their community. So briefly, I'd like to tell you about uh, a psychologist named uh, Ulrich Neisser, who talked about how space and autobiographical memory are connected. He used a cognitive framework. He was a very influential figure. I'm sure many of you know him. Uh, this is what he said. The spatial cognitive system then has several intriguing characteristics. First, it operates on a domain that has a clearly nested structure. Next slide, please. Second, the system stores information about the spatial domain in a way that captures the hierarchical structure very effectively. Common experience suggests that one can remember spatial information in considerable detail and for long periods of time. Third, the system enables us to mentally revisit places that we have once encountered without actually returning to them. Indeed, it even allows us to rearrange the furniture of those places in our imaginations. All these features of the spatial module are equally characteristic of autobiographical memory. Our memories of our own past are also organized in terms of nested units. They also preserve information for very long periods and with great richness of detail. Autobiographical memory enables us to revisit places and perhaps even to rearrange some of their details. So autobi autobiographical memories may be quite literally nested in spatial memory structures in our brains. Vittorio can definitely speak to this, which help us recall events, objects, words, uh, you name it. If we revisit a well-known physical space, either in memory or in real life, it's going to prompt the retrieval of autobiographical memories. Uh, Neisser says, spatial memory is so dependable that it can even be used as a deliberate mnemonic for the recall of non-spatial materials. Let's think of the ancient uh, arts of memory. I think that NICER uh, provides a useful tool for understanding something about the original staging of Qualse Aprile inside this medieval town of Montichiello. Here's an aerial map, and you see it's incredibly labyrinthine uh, medieval streets and piazzas. Uh, the tool that he offers allows us to uh, imagine how the very streets could induce a powerful act of shared remembrance on the part of spectators and participants who were there in 44, or who heard about it from their elders, or even from even people who weren't there but who heard about it in the play. I think it's significant that they move the play inside the walls, not outside the walls, because the, the act of doing so contains the experience, recontains it. Uh, it's putting performers and spectators inside the protective walls of the city rather than outside the gates where they got lined up to be executed. So I think that this restaging was more than just a function of using a piazza as a performance space because it was replacing a traumatic event, putting it in an enclosed and safe space. These performances generated an alternate memory of the outside brought inside, insofar as the traumatic shared memory of being dragged outside of the town for execution was resituated, removed to inside the town. And I would argue that the audience too forms a wall. Like they are part of the enclosing and protective um, barrier around the performers. Um, they bind them and fortify the outdoor space. All right, quickly some conclusions. Jose Aprile de la 44 was a site-specific performance designed and organized around the town's Piazza San Martino, its uneven elevations and its complicated sight lines. However, 
The play was site specific in another more crucial sense. The play was created not only to make use of the extant space, but to reclaim it and make it safe again for the town's inhabitants through a restaging and mastering of collective trauma. Noteworthy from my perspective, as someone who thinks about embodied cognition and also the Middle Ages and Renaissance, uh, is the role of the medieval fortification of Monte Chielo. It's a functional space, but it's also emblematic of all kinds of things. For more than 50 years, it has served not only as the physical setting for the town's autodramas, it was also the backdrop to the significant group level trauma during World War II and quite a few thereafter. Through the autodramas of the Teatro Povero, the walled town was made to function again as a viable container for the group, for its emotions, both positive and negative, and for the complicated history of the town and its people extending back over generations into a remote yet still living past. Autodrama is a technology for survival. For the people of Montechielo, autodrama provides a transgenerational means to cope with the difficulties of the past and present. It's also a powerful tool to rebuild group identity or to build and fortify group identity and to come in terms with the end of the old world in the current setting of globalization and ongoing economic crisis, which totally threaten the future of small rural communities like this one. Embodied cognitive microhistory provides a framework for understanding the play Qual se aprile del 44, and also microhistory itself. I think we can imagine other applications. I'm going to close with the words of Andrea Cresti in the film, which reminds us that all the world is a stage and in a very special way for the people of Monte Chielo. Here's what he said toward the end of the film. Objectively, I believe that the future of Monte Chielo will be like that of every other tiny village in Tuscany. And that is, it will be empty in the end. The houses will be purchased by those who can go on vacation. It will become a vacation town alive only for a few days or a few weeks. But then there's a fantasy that Monte Chielo itself will become a giant theater. And so it would be possible that even the last inhabitant would become an actor playing himself. And so our future would be inside of him as long as he lived. And that's it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna, uh, for this uh, incredibly uh, exciting and at the same time uh, moving presentation. We we have been uh, we have been working uh, on um, on this topic uh, starting in 12, 17 or early 18. It's still a work in progress and uh, the more I was listening to you, the more I was realizing uh, how good a choice it was uh, to focus on uh, Teatro Povero di Montichiello and particularly on, on the, the founding element of this theatrical community, which is the staging of this traumatic event. There are so many trails that intersect in your presentation you mentioned uh, uh, the connection between the micro and the macro, uh, which uh, beautifully, uh, uh, um, so to speak, relates with what we as cognitive neuroscientists on a daily basis uh, are trying to do, uh, which means to connect uh, the personal level of description, who we are, how do we function in the world, uh, what are the things making us happy, sad, traumatized, uh, with the underlying uh, uh, microscopic level of description, which boils down to the study of the relation between the functioning of uh, uh, these tiny little cells that we call neurons or 
uh, huge assemblies of neurons uh, in terms of brain circuits and behavior. And um, the body, as you pointed out repeatedly in your talk, uh, an acting and experiencing body, uh, I should add, uh, um, appears as a very promising uh, uh, compass, glue, uh, common denominator, uh, way to tackle uh, uh, the possibility to, to see the connection between these different levels of description that has to be integrated while at the same time being considered as distinct because they refer uh, to, uh, if you want, to, if not ontological, uh, to different epistemological uh, 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 way to address the whole, the, uh, which is uh, the human being. Um, uh, the staging of quel aprile, uh, quel 6 aprile del 44, offers uh, a variety of interesting points. Uh, uh, as you said, uh, it is an example of shared intentionality, so social cognition social interaction uh, in action. It connects uh, with the relationship between uh, memory and space. And uh, the more we study memory uh, in relation to the brain, the more we learn how intertwined uh, are spatial memories and existential living memories uh, at the level of uh, uh, this deep part of the temporal lobe uh, and neighboring areas, the hippocampus, uh, where recently, by the way, uh, um, in rodents, uh, colleagues discovered uh, uh, neurons that uh, keep track uh, of the, um, the position of others uh, within a given environment. So uh, introducing the logic of mirroring uh, also uh, in the domain uh, of, uh, of special memory. Uh, this container, uh, uh, the container of the city of Montichiello and the reversal uh, of the ritualization of the trauma, which brings inside the wall what actually, as you clearly pointed out, happened outside of it, when all the people were dragged uh, aligned the walls waiting to be executed uh, uh, by the fascist and the Nazi. Um, uh, is probably more than metaphorical uh, because um, it relates uh, uh, with the dimension uh, not just of the self but of uh, uh, a collectivity of cells, a, a community of people. Uh, um, and, and, and this reminds me, as, as we discussed in the past, of Didier uh, uh, Anzieux uh, with uh, Le Moi Peau or, or the eye skin, but uh, 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 the community, the walls, the staging is also uh, can be metaphorically uh, understood uh, as um, as a shielding uh, shared skin that, in a way, um, uh, by means of the ritualization through the performance uh, of the uh, past traumatic events, uh, uh, as you said, uh, uh, becomes a sort of foundational myth. Uh, that enabled the, the community uh, to move over uh, uh, to um, uh, to see a possible future uh, within this uh, a place that has been marked by uh, such a, a traumatic event, which, uh, 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 to make things worse, uh, is inscribed in a series of memories uh, of uh, similar events occurring in neighboring parts of Italy, where the fate of the inhabitants of villages uh, was, wasn't so lucky uh, as that of, uh, of the inhabitants uh, um, of Montichiello. So the idea that uh, uh, embodied uh, uh, cognitive microhistory uh, can be used uh, uh, as a, a sort of a magnifying uh, uh, lens uh, and apply to other domains, uh, I find it uh, really exciting. Uh, and um, it's a further demonstration how fruitful it is, the dialogue, the collaboration between neuroscience uh, 
and the humanities. I, I will stop here and uh, leave it to uh, who wants to jump in uh, uh, to ask question or uh, to contribute. Don't be shy. I'll just say I'm very interested in what all of you have heard about this. If you've heard about it, I think some of you have been there. Uh, I want to learn from you. Roberto? Roberto? Yes. Uh, in Italy, among, uh, among the colleagues, uh, uh, theater historians and especially anthropologists, anthropologists have worked on Monticello, for example, Pietro Clemente has uh, written, uh, Pietro Clemente that is, uh, um, has written uh, a lot uh, in connection uh, about Monticello experience, the theater, uh, about uh, the, the, um, the, the, the the theater and what developed also after the theater, the museum, etc. So in Italy, uh, some anthropologists and some uh, uh, theater people know about Monticello. If, if theater people know about Monticello, theater people go to Monticello. Of course, in terms, I I have spoken of Monticello to my of my with my students, but the people who do do when they have an approach that is uh, more close to social uh, social social history and history, and sometimes our colleagues are more on aesthetics, and so they don't look so much at it. But people know. And uh, we we also consider it a very important uh, um, part of our um, uh, theater life and community theater. I want to say that because I'm interested, very interested in in these teams, uh, not only in. Uh, uh, in Monticello, um, but uh, in the themes uh, that uh, in performance studies are called performing history, that is, for example, the title of a book from Freddie Rockham on another very beautiful uh, book about for me that is uh, by uh, Diana Taylor, that is uh, performing cultural memory in the Americas. Um, it, mm, I mean that uh, per, from the, from the uh, from the side of performing performance studies, these themes have been um, touched. I never heard before about uh, your uh, proposal of a um, your and uh, Victoria proposal uh, of uh, embodied cognitive microhistory. It's brand new it's, stuff. Uh, it's interesting uh, because it comes from another side. I understand that it comes from a different perspective that performance studies. Uh, it, can come, it can come in dialogue because there are many points in common and also the, the people from performance studies who touched it, for example, Diana Taylor studied similar, not Monticello, but uh, performing cultural memory in America, for example, the performances of uh, 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 Donna in Nero, Women in Black, uh, and um, no, sorry, the performances of um, um, the women in uh, Argentina, that uh, the Plaza de Mayo, that uh, are sorrow for their uh, um, for their kids that disappeared, or many other performances performances having to deal with history by the same people uh, who do. Your perspective, I understand, come from another um, from another point of view. It's interesting to me. I know microhistory. I know Ginsburg. I feel it very, very acute, very uh, how could you say acuto uh, to uh, to think that performing history, performing history as theater is a form of microhistory. I feel it very exact because theater also always uh, um, uh, work on the small scale. So I, I, I feel that very precise and I didn't uh, um, heard about it, uh, um, about a microhistory application to perform history. I don't know, sorry for my English, but that is interesting. 
also the cognitive aspect, the psychological aspect uh, is interesting. And uh, my question is uh, if you exactly enlarge, even uh, if you um, applied it, you or Vittoria, I don't know, also to other cases, other ritual performances, because I think it could be done very easily. Just an example in Bologna, you know, we had a big trauma that is uh, when in, in 1980 there was a bomb in uh, the station and 80 people died. And uh, it was, um, we every year celebrate. And uh, in 19, in uh, four years ago, there was a form of celebration that was exactly like Monticello, a, a, a kind of autodrama, a kind of autodrama. It was an historia, and the theatrical people came together. They asked the people of Bologna who would embody 80 people to embody the 80 people who were died. And they made research, they contacted the parents, they staged the moment when, uh, not in an only stage, but 80 different stages in all over the city of Bologna. And uh, uh, for uh, all the day, one person that was not a parent, but was a person by Bologna. It's the, it is a memory of the city's collective memory. So his embodiment, his cognitive, his micro history, the history of a town. I don't want to go very much in the detail in this example. I'm I'm studying it, but uh, your uh, perspective could be could be applied fruitfully. And so I my uh, question is, you never tried to apply also to other uh, kind of uh, community theater or uh, performing history phenomena uh, because uh, it's interesting. Thank you because I didn't know it and. Uh, it's an important uh, contribution to all this debate of performing history. Well, thank you. I mean, the thing that's really missing here is performance studies. I don't know ah. that here at all, but uh, you can bet I'll go look at it. That sounds really helpful. But uh, yeah, this is cutting from whole cloth. You know, uh, I don't know yet. I haven't thought it through. Like, what what else can you do with this? But my guess is exactly what you're talking about you know that sounds perfect so yeah super interesting I, I just read something in the newspaper about children performing um, plays in uh, Ukraine about um, mm. losing their parents or living in wars it's a kind of similar uh, mm -hmm. move I guess to incorporate a trauma that's happening right now in this case but that was in the New York Times a couple of days ago. Anyway, yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll look at these thank sources. Thank you. I write uh, this couple of titles. Said that if you have published something, I would like if you write back, uh, if you write in the in the chat. I'm, I'm looking at the chat. I don't find it. Uh, if you write um, any title, we can... Uh, uh, any essay, there is an essay of yours. Uh, where is the chat? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, that w w we haven't published yet. And uh, what you we said, need, Roberta, need, yeah. it's an incredible uh, stimulus to finalize the paper and, uh, and yes, get, it, yes. uh, get it done and get it published. Uh, uh, as I said before, uh, we sat on it. Uh, uh, the paper had uh, different developmental phases. Uh, and I think Anna had uh, uh, this idea of embodied uh, cognitive microhistory, uh, which um, um, ignited new energy into the paper. And I think that we are very close. And your, your um, remarks on uh, uh, performance studies uh, are certainly something we, we, we need to look into uh, 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 to connect uh, uh, to this perspective and be sure you'll be the first to have uh, the first draft of the finalized paper. We'll make sure that it reaches you uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think 
there was uh, Lisa Hilton-Muzinski who turned on the camera. Maybe she's willing to contribute to the discussion. Please go ahead. Yes, um, actually, I'm a historiographer and uh, I have um, written on the uh, history theory of Hayden White. Oh. And and uh, so I'm familiar with Carlo Ginsburg and yeah, um, <laughs> what what I'm what I'm very interested in is the nature of history and uh, the nature of historiography and mm. and what I see you doing is uh, bringing um, the writing of history uh, to something <laughs> um, more towards psychotherapy. And um, uh, I understand, Vittoria, that you are uh, one of the founding um, uh, editors on uh, the Journal of Neuro uh, Psychoanalysis, is right? And and uh, I'm just reading the Hidden Spring um, by Mark Solms, and mm. and and uh, I'm I'm very interested in the function of metaphor in all of this, and <laughs> I'm I'm currently. Um, writing a paper on on the metaphors of um, Ferdinand de Saussure, um, because uh, what what a lot of people don't realize is that um, Saussure used metaphors to guide his uh, theory making as a model of, of of language of linguistics, and Hayden White used um, Saussure and Vico. He combined Saussure and Vico. And um, I'm, I'm, I, I tuned in because um, um, I know Carla Ginsburg's microhistories and 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 the the other microhistories uh, that have been written um, in this tradition. And um, I I just would like to know a little bit how this could be, you know, brought to the nature of history and how we could maybe. Um, rewrite historiography what what would historiography look like um uh, as an embodied cognitive microhistory that's that's something that's something that none of the historiographers have thought about at least not in america this is something quite new and interesting yeah we're just making it up <laughs> Yes, well, I, I know, Vittoria, you have co cooperated with uh, George Lakoff. Yes, when I was in Berkeley, uh, we worked on this paper, uh, The Brain's Concepts, uh, which was quite problematic uh, um, to get it published because, uh, uh, I mean, in cognitive linguistics, uh, the body uh, is still uh, an alien creature, and uh, and so, um, they immediately uh, point you to uh, the referential role of language, uh, and uh, uh, people are in, in cognitive linguistic, I should say, are much more interested in recursivity, uh, generativity, syntax. Uh, when uh, you touch uh, uh, semantics, meaning, uh, and the relation to the body, uh, things uh, gets problematic. Uh, uh, but um, I think that paper was uh, was very interesting to me because uh, it it enabled me to to find new ways to to connect uh, the brain, the body, and language. Yes. And uh, we we pursued that line of uh, investigation in Parma, and very recently we started to after having demonstrated together with other colleagues. Uh, the, the close relationship between uh, uh, the body and the understanding of not only of the description of body reaction, but also, for example, uh, there were colleagues uh, that published uh, an fMRI paper showing beautifully uh, that when you read uh, uh, tactile metaphors, uh, for example, uh, uh, that guy was pretty rough to me. Uh, what you see is the activation of the tactile part of your brain, which maps your encounter uh, with the palm of your hand with a rough surface, uh, uh, so to speak. 
And so I think this is uh, pretty, pretty clear to me. What is far less clear is how to connect embodiment uh, with a more abstract aspect of, uh, of language. And that's why we decided recently uh, to tackle um, um, linguistic negation and trying to connect linguistic negation with motor inhibition. Uh, we are at the beginning of this investigation uh, uh, with um, a few paradigm. One of our former PhD students uh, um, has worked and keep working on that. Um, the more abstract aspect of, of, of language uh, have to be addressed by embodied cognition because otherwise it's a uh, uh, you don't have the whole story, and I, as I see it, uh, it, it's still a, a long journey. But definitely, uh, uh, if we maintain ourselves at the level of metaphors, then uh, I think the evidence is already pretty convincing. And uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, um, no, maybe it was, no, you mentioned poor Robert, I don't remember, Giovanni Battista Vico, uh, in, in my hands, Vico is is a uh, incredible forerunner of people like Lakoff and Johnson because uh, uh, he's, he makes very clear that even when you deal with the the most abstract aspect of uh, of of language, uh, you do it. Uh, um, I quote, not exactly uh, literally, but uh, what he says uh, is something like that by means of transpositions of the human body and the human passions uh, in the Nova Scienza. So it's an old uh, 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 tradition of thought uh, that cognitive science and body cognitive science uh, has reawakened, uh, revitalized, uh, and uh, that's why I think that uh, uh, bringing together uh, uh, scholars of uh, uh, performances, historians, anthropologists, uh, uh, scholars of literature, uh, cognitive scientists, neuroscientists uh, is crucial uh, because these issues are bestly addressed uh, from uh, a multiplicity of perspective in the hope that one day or, or, or the other uh, someone can come up with a synthesis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Marta uh, had a question. Yes, here I am. Um, thanks, thanks a lot for for uh, for your presentation. And um, I, I took some notes because there are several aspects that um, emerged, and I found it particularly interesting. Um, first, of, first of all, the the temporal dimension of of the body that that emerges in in this specific. Uh, uh, case study. So it's an historical body. It's a body that narrates uh, um, the autobiographical story, but also the story, uh, the collective story, the, the story of the of all the inhabitants, the past uh, and also the present, the present inhabitants as a as a um, as a consequence, as a direct consequence, no, as a as a obvious relation and. Um, I was also impressed by the picture of the bodies of the audience uh, that you show us uh, um, because I think there was um, yeah, this bodily attention that is typical of the theatrical situation of the here and how, which is, which is unique in, in, in theater. But I, I, I think I had the impression that in this specific case, this could be enhanced because they, uh, the audience, see um, uh, see uh, not only the, the 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 actors and the actresses as a, um, yeah as a, but but they, they, they their friends maybe that they their their relatives and that, that there is. A, a particular bonding between the two sides, no? I, I, yeah, and um, I, 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 my, my question um, is is about the education of these bodies on the stage, 
because we we usually know that the actors and the actresses on the stage at the, um, has have a training have uh, they took classes they uh, learn in um, academia um, how how to act um, physical theater emotional theater whatever and um, I was wondering, what, what is the process in, in, in this specific case of Monticello to realize the, the, the yeah, to stage the, 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 the story, the, the, the performance? Uh, how do they uh, reach the, yeah, the, the, the final the, the display of, of um, yeah, th this is the question. Thank you. It's a good question, a set of questions. It's hard for me to answer because I haven't been there and I haven't, I mean, I'm learning about this from, you know, at several removes, right? But uh, I think it's key that the actors are, were started out as untrained. I mean, that was the point that, you know, like, what does that do to have no training? And so after 50 years, you definitely build up some training. You know, and people are people were recognized by their past performances and by the kinds of roles they played, and so they would um, their their newest roles would somehow be sometimes very consciously written uh, in relation to other parts. Yes, but I'm play. talking about. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if that's supposed to be there. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't know. You know what? I, what I see was from the movie Spectacolo, which is sort of the the most information that, that I have about how they about what their process was. But I think it would take spending time with them. Uh, unfortunately, so many people have died in the last few years, and I don't even know if it's going to continue. So, but but talking with surviving members of the company to find out how they did it is key. Uh, it's a it's a great question. I just can't answer it with a lot of um, specificity. Yeah, thank you, because I think as an actress and uh, thinking also about um, my education as an actress, if, if I remember my first experience in the class and I compare my uh, current experience as an actress, they are completely different. Uh, and in a way, the, the education, the, 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 the classes uh, um, build uh, um, and, and gi gi gives you the, the technical instruments uh, uh, to uh, realize the performance or whatever. But uh, the an education or in, in education, I don't know how to say exactly, but um, gives these uh, uh, this kind of freedom uh, that it, then you you lose in a way here by here. So there is a, a kind of a higher potential uh, because it's something that is new, that is unknown. Uh, I don't know if um, if um, it's clear how, what I want to, I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think so. That uh, there's something unexpected about what comes out. Of, yeah. of performance when you haven't had extensive training, when you're trying to find your way into it as a newcomer. Yeah. Is that right? Exactly. There's a little time lag across the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I love these questions. They're not ones I think about because I'm not a theater person. So it's super helpful to talk to you, all of you, from your perspectives, because you see things that I don't. But yeah. Um, I hope you go to Montequilo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting to see uh, how they uh, developed uh, um, after this um, founding uh, performance of Quel uh, uh, Aprile del 44. Um, as you said, uh, yeah, uh, these are non definitely all non professional actors. Uh, but what is remarkable is what they stage, because year after year, uh, uh, they, they first uh, converge upon um, a topic that was a common interest for the community. So 
the the uh, the aspect of the of the psycho or auto drama uh, got uh, uh, not only established but reinforced uh, year after year because along the years they uh, addressed by 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 staging it uh, and impersonating it all the problems that dawn on this uh, uh, like many other small communities the the crisis uh, uh, of uh, uh, the division of the uh, uh, of big uh, uh, stretches. Uh, of, uh, of land uh, to be formally owned by very few uh, landowners, uh, uh, the introductions of uh, so-called modernity, the globalization, the supermarkets, uh, 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 the people leaving uh, uh, this small village uh, because it's not appealing anymore, because it's getting more and more difficult uh, to make a living, uh, leaving it for uh, bigger centers in Tuscany or elsewhere. So uh, it is not just the fact that these were non-actors performing a script. Uh, I think what is distinctive of this experience in Teatro Povero di Montichiello is also the choice of, of uh, uh, the plot, the, uh, the script uh, uh, to be staged, which is something uh, with which uh, uh, the actors live uh, uh, with on a on a daily basis. It's part of their existence. And so the, the efficacy of these performances that attracted so many people uh, from, 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 from the world of cinema, theater, literature in Montichiello was uh, this, uh, uh, this paradox of uh, uh, efficacy in spite of a total lack of uh, actorial technique, uh, as you, Martha, pointed out. I don't know if, uh, Anna, you, you want to add something on that. Uh, not just yet, not just yet. Okay. Um, any more questions or contributions? Well, thanks for coming. Yeah. And if you have ideas, feel free to send them to us. Uh, we need to really think through what uh, embodied cognitive micro -his history might be, what, what kinds of things, what other things it might be used for, and also kind of uh, build it further into an analysis of this performance. But yeah, if you have ideas uh, later on, feel free to email. Love to hear from you. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Thank you, again, uh, Anna, Grazie. for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all for joining us. And I, I want to thank also the, um, uh, the people who will uh, see this presentation on uh, the recording that we will upload soon uh, on YouTube. Uh, I want to thank uh, once more Marta because uh, she was uh, uh, literally the, the main driver of this uh, wonderful initiative. I think uh, we all uh, learned a lot uh, through all the great uh, speakers and participants that we had. And uh, I, I, I think we all look, looking forward to um, new initiatives of, uh, of this kind that uh, the lab Neuroscience and the Humanities uh, will be glad to organize uh, in the near future. Thank you all, have a great uh, uh, weekend, and uh, particularly you, Anna, have a great uh, family reunion uh, in Arizona, in Tucson. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.